Kimberly Sr., um, a director and a part of the Artistic Collective here at the Goodman Theater. And I want to welcome you to this very, very special artist encounter that we're having this evening, um, a conversation that I get to have with Emmy and Golden Globe winner Joey Soloway, who is also one of my personal heroes. Um, this is a part of a series of artist encounters that we've been having during um, this part uh, of our lives uh, at the Goodman, you know, we were having so many conversations about like, what is it that we miss about being in the theater aside from seeing incredible plays, both from our canon and our present and our future being excellently brought to life on our stages, but that how much we miss connection and investigation and curiosity and how, when we go to the theater, we ask questions about ourselves and others and, these artist encounters are one of the ways that we're attempting to engage ourselves and also engage with you at home um, to keep keep all those synapses firing um, while we await our return. Um, in addition to the artist encounters, we also have a Live at Five series that there's a really exciting Christmas Carol one that's coming up, I believe this Friday. Uh, there's also, um, speaking of a Christmas Carol, there's this beautiful um, like new audio version that uh, we have made that's available on our website and we'll be streaming um, for free through public radio on Christmas Eve and on Christmas Day. And it's really special. You can hear the language in a whole new way and a marvelous way to kind of spend time with your family and not look at something and engage in that sense. And we also have um, artistic associate, written and performed by artistic associate, Dale Orlander Smith's Until the Flood, which uh, if you did not have the opportunity to see live and in person, it is a magical and wonderful um, and very, very, very challenging experience that um, we can enjoy. And that is able to be seen for free through our partners with All Arts. Um, so uh, tonight we'll be, Joey and I'll be talking, but you can uh, type in questions through YouTube and through Facebook, and we will get to those questions at the end. And now I'm going to read a bio um, for the partner, my partner in this conversation. Joey is from and grew up in Chicago and is perhaps best known as the creator, writer, director, and producer of the groundbreaking television series Transparent which won eight Emmy Awards and two Golden Globes. Joey is now working with their sibling, musician and lyricist Faith Soloway on bringing Transparent the Musical to Broadway. Uh, Joey's also the co-creator of the Amazon original series, I Love Dick, and they've worked as a writer and as a producer on many, many more of my favorite shows, including Six Feet Under, The United States of Tara, Grey's Anatomy, and How to Make It in America. Joey is also a filmmaker, published memoirist, activist, and so, so much more. Um, I wanted to talk with Joey, uh, I mean, for any number of thousands of reasons, but one is that when I watched the pilot episode of Transparent, I, I really, for the first time, felt so seen and felt like this is, this is the Jurassic mess of humanity, and it's, it's not my family, not my story, but feel I felt so connected to it and it hit me on such a visceral level and it shows so much the power of, of what art can do for us. Um, and also having read uh, a lot of their writing and listened to a lot of their speeches, feeling very inspired um, as an artist about how we can change the narrative in our culture and in our world um, and put different people at the center, both of our stories and of our lenses. And so this inspiration felt like someone I, I wanted to be near. And so this is the nearest we can get in this moment. <laughs> so without further ado, I'd love to begin our conversation and welcome into this forum, the fantastic Joey Soloway. Hey there. Hi. How's it going? Did you get to hear my intro or? Yeah, what? it was lovely. It was great. Oh, I'm so glad that it's daytime in LA. And I feel like in Chicago, everybody's starting their dinner and it's nighttime and you guys have a storm settling. Oh no, you're in New York. I'm in, well, I'm in, I'm in New Jersey. We're, yeah. we're already, yeah. That's we're still, we're still market. 70, 70 and sunny. <laughs> I mean, it was this, it's so sad because they're saying there's like no such thing as a snow day anymore. No, I mean, that's why everybody's always home. It's like, yeah, years of snow days. It's not that like, oh great, we get to stay home and play board games and yeah. Well, we've been doing that since March. <laughs> you know? yeah, a, month, a month of snow days. It's a, uh, it's, it's a very, right, it's this moment too of like, I feel so much of, of your work and what I love about your work is right, this investigation of family. And I think that like now just 
we're all globally having like a new personal exploration of family, whether you're someone who is like home by themselves or who is, you know, different generations are living together in a way that they haven't in a long time. And mm -hmm. um, I think there's a, probably a whole, a whole new series of this, right? Like what happens when you can't leave your house? I mean, if we, if you had made this like a, two years ago, like here's a story of a family that, was trapped at home together for nine months with nothing yeah, know, right? part nobody, of yeah. humanity and you know like <laughs> nobody would believe it nobody would believe it and yet here <laughs> here we are um i guess i'm trying to like what the first thing is that i want to like get into with you and it feels like I, this idea which you know we talked about a little bit the other day about about decentering and like mm -hmm. if you could define that and then I'd love to just brainstorm with you and hear ways that you're doing that and also like what what we can all do to sort of adjust our lenses in that way. Yeah. Well, I guess everything feels like it's going to be different when we come out of this pandemic and not just because we spent all this time at home together, but also because I think we're starting to just question what reality was before it. I think we didn't, I didn't realize the degree to which fascism was so present in the United States and white supremacy, you know, just I think in the last, you know, since the uprising for black lives and watching what's happening around Trump, the sort of just presence of white supremacy is so great that I feel like it's really hard to go back to anything that you have planned before this creatively. There's no back, right? We can't go yeah, back. Yeah, like we have to re, yeah, we have to re-understand everything through white supremacy and patriarchy. I was already constantly thinking about it, but I think for me, just thinking about um, white supremacy became, I guess patriarchy, you know, when the Me Too thing was going on and people were trying to say like, hey, this is what we mean by an ambient sense of belonging that men have in the world and so at work. And trying to explain to men when they would, you know, ask questions of like, well, but you know, I, I asked for consent or I asked for a hug or, you know, I, I um, I love everybody I work with. It's like, I think what women and queer people and trans people wanted the cis men to know is like that when you are cis and male in patriarchy, everybody kind of has to make sure that you're happy. That's always been done around you. And it's actually, you know, it's, it's a burden. It's a burden centering you. And then I think in the past year, it became the same conversation about white people, you know, and, um, Everybody has to then begin to just like peel off, uh, address their privilege, peel off their privilege, and just think about the simple act of centering oneself creatively as something that's really perpetuating privilege. You know, yeah. antagonism perpetuates privilege. So I think, and, and then of course, if you weren't doing the own work on yourself and people were also in your community calling people in or calling people out or calling people in, leaders, institutions, and saying, what was once thought of as a, as a casual kind of centering of whiteness and, and decentering of, of non-whiteness is actually, you know, it's white supremacy in action, it's racist, it's racist policy. I mean, we watched um, so many institutions be faced with their own racism with this new language and new tools. So even if we weren't all going through these personal transformations where I think we, we, we would have to come out as different artists, you know, the whole world is. So I think everything has to be rethought really. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Period. Um, but there, it's also this thing of, I, I find so much of when I'm making my own work that I like, it's like, I'll have a question or a thing that I'm trying to solve and that it, I don't have the answers when I set out to make the work, you know, like it's not something that I already know the answer to. So like in this case of like, how 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 am I how am I how am I placing myself at the center of a story or how am I um trying to remove this like monolithic entity of the white male patriarchy, which has just been the air I've been breathing, mm -hmm. um, just the air that's been pumped in, like to, through no fault of anybody, just it's been there, like that it's through the through the act of making the work and then like it being witnessed by the audience that comes in that together we're trying to like solve and wrestle and then like eventually heal mm. but like in the pro the process of it yeah it's like, 
here here's the moment opening for it on. But I actually wanted to ask you just because I'm sure like a ton of people who would be watching this are so curious. Like, have you heard what's the gossip? World of theater. When are we getting back in seats? What are people saying? In your I mean, mind, when is it going to happen again? I think it depends in a lot of ways about how you define theater. Are you saying like a Broadway theater that has to try to get a, a thousand people, at least fill 700 of the seats to, to, to break some sort of even? I mean, I think that we can, I believe that we can't. So this is like the Kimberly theory is like, we're gonna change the way that we think of like, what does theater equal? And we can go back to thinking about like Peter Brook's empty space and we can think about site specific theater and like, what does immersive theater mean? And I mean, I remember it was like in the nineties and I, I wish I could remember the name of the people that did this, but there was this amazing Beckett piece of like Rockabye that was in like someone's apartment in Wicker Park you know, back when like no one even really went to work. Yeah, I remember. Mm -hmm. And it was so- well, What about like all those seats and all those buildings in New York and, and the yeah. good men and, and, and people sitting next to each other? Vaccine, like, right? Is that, do, do we have to wait till we're like all- Like everybody's vaccinated maybe? Well, everybody's vaccinated. Um, yeah. Right, and then that runs into the question of like, who's getting those vaccines? Who has access to those vaccines? Like- And who has know, access to theater? Yeah, and who has access to theater. And then it brings up all of those other questions that we're also having. So I think like, you know, my my hope is right. to say like, maybe we start making some stuff in April and May and maybe in the summer. And, you know, hopefully by like next year's Christmas, Carol, we'll be able to see a full house at the Goodman again. But mm -hmm. it's, I think a lot of it's going to be, I, I, I do think there's going to be something really exciting. You having also spent this time in Chicago as I did as well, like, I think some of the smaller theaters are going to be able to come back faster because mm -hmm. they're not as dependent. You know, they're only they playing. don't need to sell 500 seats to make their night. They only have 50 and they're probably used yeah. to only selling at 30 seats so that their income sources are from other places. So maybe, and maybe there'll be a, like a resurgence in understanding like what that, like how joyful it is to go and see theater with a big old pole in the middle of the yeah. day. <laughs> Everything's going to be really joyful. All the ways of gathering after this, every single way, getting invited to a dinner party you never would have wanted to go to before. Yeah, no, you're like there <laughs> early. Like, yeah, and, the then like, and then when you're leaving the dinner party, you're like, thank you so much <laughs> for cooking for me. <laughs> you know, you're like, Thank you. Like everything is going to have, everything's going to have new meaning. And I think that's great. Like the, the days that I'm feeling optimistic, right? Like I move from like gratitude to terror and back again sometimes in like the yeah. of an hour, right? You know, but that like when I am feeling that gratitude, I think about like the theater is going to live in a way it hasn't lived before because I can still watch TV pandemic or not. Right. Mm -hmm. But like the, I can't, I can't sit next to a stranger in the dark and grapple with the questions of the day and laugh at the same joke. And I mean, I've sat in theater sometimes where the you know person next to you know we grabbed each other in a moment mm -hmm. or like that's happened. Mm -hmm. And it's like the theater is one of the few safe. Yeah, and we just we're just aware of our yeah. um, you know humanity in a in a in a different in a different way. Yeah. Um, you know, and talking about tiny theaters and talking about families being together um, and talking about Chicago uh, makes me think, which maybe not everybody knows about how much of your, can you talk a little bit about your Chicago roots and your beginnings of storytelling here in Chicago? Sure. There in Chicago well, where neither of us are? Um, yeah, my sister and I and my parents all grew up in a neighborhood called South Commons, which was 28th in Michigan. It was kind of like a newfangled experiment in architecture and race and class and there was an amazing community of people there and one of the things that came out of there was our family's love of community theater so we were always putting on plays and faith and i were putting on plays with like the kids in the neighborhood and then let's see gold coast lane tech went to madison came back and started becoming um working in the film business working at car Temkin and documentaries and my sister and i faith was faith at the time had written the music for co-ed prison sluts at the Annoyance Theater. And Faith and I had the idea with our friends, Becky Thayer and Melanie Hutzel. We were like hanging out in my mom's house and like Becky and Melanie were imitating Martian Jan Brady. Yes. 
And Faith was like, this should be a play. And I was like, yeah, we should write some like fake episodes, right? And Faith was like, no, we should just like put the actual thing up. Like just the TV <laughs> show. And yeah, we went to the AMVETs and we bought the ponchos. And then I sat there with some headphones and recorded the, you know, and just like transcribed the Brady episode. The best and part of the <laughs> had the relationship with Mick Napier at the Annoyance because of Poet Prison Slots. And we asked for a slot and they gave us Tuesday nights at eight. And our friend Eric Waddell did the real life game show and we made, made some flyers. And we, I remember, you know, walking up and down the street on Broadway, um, handing out flyers because that was how we did it because, you know, no internet. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, handing out the flyers and like from the very first time we did, we did the show there, people just kind of showed up and the, the, I think the second, the second performance of it, like we did it one night, we did it on a Tuesday and the next Tuesday, I think we were taking a taxi to the theater and there was all this traffic and there were all these like people out on the streets and I turned to faith and I was like, something must've happened. There must've been like some weird accident or a bomb threat. Like how we're never gonna get to the theater. Like why are all these people out, you know, on Broadway and like hundreds of people were out in front of the annoyance trying to buy tickets. Amazing. It was I love so it. crazy. We went up, we up on the roof and we all like sat and watched, you know, watch the hubbub on the street. And yeah, it was you have a um, clip of it. I want to play roll the clip. Let's play the <laughs> I can't even watch it. It's so funny to me. Well, and it was so crazy. The audience is like the audience. They're some of them are groaning in <laughs> pleasure, like at getting their little nostalgia memory spots hit. You know, it's just so fun to hear. It's it's the audience was nuts. I the love nostalgia hearing. Nostalgia is so powerful. That's what. It, that's exactly the word that was in my head when I was watching. Is just, and even now you're you're getting to have nostalgia for the moment mm -hmm. of like, making it and watching it with others. It is so, God, why, why was the Brady Bunch such a big hit? I think it was like, I think the um, the family without it being family, I think it was really gendered because it, it was like in a world where all girls had blonde hair and all boys had brown mm -hmm. hair. It was a very like chocolate and vanilla, yeah. binary, dependable world where people didn't have to deal with any blood relations. It was like everybody had somebody to be attracted to. <laughs> <laughs> like everybody had like, a person to be their, you know, date, brother. They were like matched in this way that I think was very satisfying yeah. at, for an adolescent or for a kid to feel like safe in family. I think it felt like a very safe family. Yeah, it did. No real blood. No, no, none of that dirty, awful DNA, you know? 
And like and like with all the chaos going on in the world to be able to like come home and be in like be at the Brady's and Alice is there and you get to have problems like homework and pimples and yeah I, it was I think it was also modeling for everybody what like a dream family would be like you know your parents asking about your homework or family dinners you know mm. um I think it was just like this dream of how family should be or could be even though of course it, it none of it was realistic if, if from my memory and also just from that like clip we just watched it, it did feel like whatever the whenever there was conflict right because of course we were need even the tiniest bit of conflict to propel forth the episode it was always like someone trying to like individuate outside of this structure <laughs> right like and that the conflict like we right. think of like do i strike out on my own or do i yes. stand like i feel loyal to the band yet i kind of want to go out on my own and i really want a beaded curtain in my bedroom you know like right. there's you remember you remember it all yes you remember what happened next that like greg was the only one who got the call tammy yeah. Cotton was not in fact interested in the other five and then he like reinvented himself for a hot minute and then they yeah. if i recall correctly they kind of did a family intervention of like you're forgetting who you are and right I think he became, I think that's Johnny Bravo. I think he became Johnny Bravo. Yeah, I remember that. And also when, um, it was the Brady Bunch that went to Hawaii, correct? Yeah. It was very spooky and it was a devil episode. This yeah. is also, this is also seared. In, in, yes, it's all seared. In the, in the seared in the tuna world. of our minds. Correct. <laughs> 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 um, so yeah, so it, 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 it is not surprising to me that from, from the mind of this, um, Cup Brady band bunch, which really is like the smartest idea. It's like we do it in music all the time. Like, how many Steely Dan cover bands are there? There should be a right. Yeah, I'm. I mean, I might start a transparent cover band. <laughs> I can just go act out the episodes with my own children. Exactly. I know. Yeah. I mean, that's it. It's it is about like not just putting up the Brady bunch, but like having the shared conversation with the audience about the detail. You know, so like the laugh track and the way they move. You know, and the way the way Becky Thayer would do Marsha's voice or the way Ben Zook kind of just like shook, just like Peter, you know, these brilliant comedians, it's really all about their timing and their comment on the shared memory that was like making people in the audience just convulse. It's so great. And it's like no surprise that like from this, I mean, many, many, many you know, I was like looking to, I was like, gosh, wow, six feet under is also sort of about that, right? Like yeah. this kind of, how do we, sure. how do we individuate? How do we, like the, the the mantle of like inheritance of character traits and and family story and lore and like what were the pieces that you want to keep and that you love and the pieces mm -hmm. that you struggle with and tear away from and that kind of that ritual of becoming um yeah. feels really like at the center uh tribe it's like i think somebody told me that all all shows were really about people finding their family and their tribe or finding their tribe and their family, just like, as you said, finding your place in a group of people and individuating and, you know, finding this reflection, finding this safety. And then, you know, saying a version of like, would you still love me if was mm -hmm. what the question was at the heart of transparent. Yes. And that question was kind of like being asked over and over again. Right. And that, then, and, and sometimes that question came out as like a roar or like a, a dare. And sometimes mm -hmm. it was a whisper and it was just like, Cause it's, it's actually kind of like the hardest thing to ask because you never want to ask a question, but like a, a question that brings up that type of vulnerability where you're yeah. not confident of the answer. Yeah. But that's, that's really, and the wrestle that's in it too of um, like, I love, I can love you and you can drive me insane. And like both those things can be true. And like my heart is capable of holding those things. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that yeah. that work is so um, yeah. in there. And you know, it really yeah. does lend itself to a musical, right? Because it's like, if if the old the old saying goes, who I don't know who said it, but right, there's something about like, we sing what we cannot say. Yes, totally. And so yes. it, Yeah, yeah. So it was in some ways like Faith and I, when I think about those days back in South Commons and, and watching my parents do these musicals, and being in the musicals, Faith and I were always in the chorus. And my parents, you know, Gilbert and Sullivan and just like Pinafore and 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 having it seem totally normal that people would put on costumes and belt out a song and then have a pizza party afterwards. Like it really became our 
dream of what adulthood meant. And we would listen to Jesus Christ Superstar and Hair and, you know, my parents' cast albums. And I think just really dream of something that ended up really being just like the transparent musical finale. It was this like fantasia of Judaism and God and search for self and will you still love me if and of missing, you know, bat mitzvah. And I, you know, we, I feel so lucky that we got to make it, that we got to dance it and sing it and live it. Um, and, you know, we're, I, I feel like we're not quite like in the announcement stage, but I can share some gossip that we are working on a version for the Broadway. We, we laugh when we'd be like, yeah, okay, Broadway version. I guess that assumes it's going to be on Broadway. Um, yeah. Before <laughs> the Broadway theater has said, please come be on Broadway, but we call it the Broadway version. Um, right. And yeah, Faith is writing more songs and the Pfeffermans live and will always live in, you know, the, 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 the Pfeffer verse. <laughs> so, okay. I have so many questions. My, my first question is about, um, so like when you set out to, and, and wrote Transparent in the first place, did you always know that there was a big musical finale or when was that idea born? Well, so Faith is a great, Faith is like a genius singer, songwriter, musician, lyricist, composer. You know, I, I think there's always been this part of me since we were kids, which is like, you know, Faith's musical genius must be seen by the world. You know, it sort of was like one of my, you know, main life paths. And um, I really do actually feel like she is a musical genius who has not, you know, had her do as so many women, people of color, queer people, trans people, disabled people, and other otherized people, people who are not white, cis men. Um, you know, we've all just been so sidelined by the world and by ourselves. We just have spent so much time putting so much energy toward making sure that white men, white people, men, always feel centered in that ambient sense of belonging. So even when I look back on those days at the annoyance and I look back on the Miss Vagina pageant and these other kinds of like things that we were doing where we were putting our hand up and going, I want to, I am, you know, let me, let me have the stage, let me direct, you know. Um, it was still so hard really to get the access. And once we had the access, we never wanted to feel, be overly competitive, you know. So I think of like Second City, all mostly men, two women, um, you know, just used to the ambient sense of belonging, the, the, the air that we breathe being white, male, straight. Mm -hmm. And then everybody else had to go, oh, me. And then we would get our moments and then we would still feel awful for taking them. Mm -hmm. And. Or over, overly grateful or. Grateful, yeah. yeah. And then and so the, and like, like, taking up too much space and not wanting to get too much attention. And and yeah, it's uh, it was treacherous. It wasn't It wasn't nothing. And then, yeah, watching just for me, especially in Chicago and being surrounded by so many brilliant female comedians, Susan Messing, Beth Cahill, some of the people who were in that clip, you know, um, and watching all the men rise, you know, over and over and over again, just like every single, you know, I, I say, I say to people, you know, like, they're like, who'd you come up with? I'm like, every one, every single guy, you know, who's famous in comedy right now was there. Yeah. And what was I doing? Nothing. Just applauding, flirting, trying to date them, hoping they would like me. Yeah. Like I was, I, I, I would, it, we, we were finding our voices, but we were also very okay with being off to one side in a way that I look back at and I go, yeah, it's just. Well, it's, grateful it's, just to be in the room. Like, grateful to be in the room. I know, you know, years later now and you realize just how much you have to center yourself just to get up in the morning and go, I, I see, I want, I write, I am like the, the, the power that it takes to believe in yourself enough to write, you know, I still struggle with it. I still struggle with all of the shame of like, how dare you say anything? You know, someone's going to call you're, you something. You're changing the narrative though, because you, there are now people who the stories that you watched or that I watched and, and honestly, so many of those great musicals, right. Are very, um, right. they, they are, they are from this very white, cis male centered mind and world and like caretaking that like the, are you okay? How can we make your world more comfortable for you? Yeah. Um, but now you luckily for all of us have had, you have put things out into the world where that's changing. And so 
a young creator, like my daughter is a, she like loves writing and one of her favorite like games to play is when we watch TV, she tries to call the next line. Like she's always yeah. like, she like writes television while we're watching it. It's her mm -hmm. and She's seeing different stories now. So like, hopefully she won't have to be taught. Like you can be at the center because yeah. That, that's that's the work that you're that you're doing. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. so you know, and 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 then the people adjacent to you, and and it's 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 something else. So I just hope you know that that you're that you're doing that, yeah. and you're getting Faith's music out there because I do want to go back to that question of when yes. the, the musical is born. But before I do that, speaking of questions, I want to remind anybody. First of all, welcome if you just uh, joined us. Um, I'm Kim really Senior, speaking with the fabulous Joey Soloway. Mm -hmm. um, but whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, you can um, type questions in and we will hopefully get to them or most of them at the end. So now back to my question, which is, when was the idea of the musical finale born? Like, right. how what did that it grow? It kind of was always there. It was kind of always hovering there behind Transparent in many ways. We were, we were marching our way towards the show becoming a musical when Shelly sang on the cruise the following year as we were trying to figure out what was next. We, we were starting like a storyline of Shelly um, writing a musical about the family and, you know, sort of taking over the narrative and wanting to seal the narrative and doing so through music. So I think it was, she, you know, it was always there. It was always coming. You know, theater was always coming for the TV show. Yeah. Okay. That's great. And so then where did the idea, and I totally see that. I mean, my big smile is like, yes, she's like <laughs> totally trying to hijack the narrative. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and then like for her own actualization. But I yeah, know of course. Her. She needs it. I know. Well, and, and then, you know, and Ari as well, trying to hijack the narrative. And this is ultimately about subjectivity and wanting, you know, to not be seen, you know, not be the object and be the subject. So everybody's struggling for, you know, the lead role is really what it's like to be in a Jewish family anyway. Anyway, totally. And everybody who like probably actually, like I'm right now like, oh, I probably am the lead in my family, but I think it's somebody else. Like, yeah, right, like, exactly. Yeah, um, like, I'm only getting paid as a co-star. <laughs> <laughs> Where's my agent? <laughs> It's a very, it is, it's a very funny, well, I also think too, I wonder if they're going to like interview a panel of people to either, but the two poll questions I have, one would be like, who do you think, like whose narrative is the narrative of transparent? Like what the answer would be, but also like how, um, like how, I feel like people all the time are asking, you know, creators, like which one of the characters are mm -hmm. you? Which I'm happy to ask you, although I feel like you're. I think it was everybody. I feel like, everybody. I feel like, I feel like you're in all of them, and I feel, yeah, and all the writers were everybody, and, and I feel like I'm all of them. Like watching it, I'm like, oh, I'm every single one of the. Especially yeah. the children, like I embody them all. <laughs> like, yeah. is, so. I think that I think ultimately the theme of transparent we realized like over many years was that here was a family who had lived with the secret for many years, and now that the secret was gone. How do we how do we find where we begin and where others end, you know? And who are we without the secret? Mm -hmm. And for me, I always saw it as like this family holding on to kind of a ring of light as they're as they're heading down a, a waterfall of life. And they're all mm -hmm. holding on to this ring. It's like a life preserver. So and that's the thing that's changing, you know, whose wow. perspective it is. Instead of saying, here's the protagonist as kind of this omnibus narrator, which is like six feet under, actually, same, where, you know. It, there is no center. And I think that's that's what's fun about it and relatable. Love it. Um, I'm sorry, I keep looking over here because my my dog has identified something out the window that he uh -oh. is, that is. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, no, wait, don't eat that. Sorry, excuse me. I mean, do you want me to just take hold of the, uh, shall I take hold of the? Uh... I have to sleep with earplugs because there's like five tiny children that live downstairs oh, from us okay. and he's trying to eat one of my earplugs. That's not okay. No, not for him or for me. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Hi, we're back. So, Great. um, actually, no. We have a we have a clip, which which I think would be great from um transparent from the musical finale, which I think uh really highlights um some some conflicting intentions as we cling to the ring of life. So mm -hmm. if we can if we can play that would be great. Believe you would force Rita to give up our baby for adoption to it? protect me? Is that? that is what? fucked up. Did no, you just say Rita? that is not fucked up. That, that is love. Ha! Huh? Yeah. 
Okay. Is that supposed to be oh, us? Oh, oh, my tushies. Come Mom. here. Tushies, come meet your doppelbangers. Are you making a play about our family right well, now? Did you just say doppelbangers? Because that's not going to happen. Has a because Laura just died. Is this story. why you wanted to change the funeral no, date? I, I, the temple is only mind. giving me access to this room for a very limited Please. amount of time. And I thought if we could do it on a Monday not instead of on a Sunday. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. I hear one you. I'm hearing one of me. I'm hearing you. No, that one. Come look. No, no. No, it doesn't. No, he looks just like you. Yes, she's right. Why is my weed dealer here? Mom, why is my weed dealer here? Here. No, but that's my Mora. Oh, I, what? I didn't tell you. You that. a weed dealer? I mean, I prefer healer to dealer, but kind of. Oh, yeah. okay. But I don't understand how you got here. Oh, magic. Facebook. Oh, that's the ring. Oh, my God. Take this off, Punky. Mom, I want to use it in the play. Mom, no, 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 because it. I know. Use you're it not... in the play because this is what Maura proposed oh, to me I'm with. Wearing, I'm I'll give it back. It. No, I'm you're not using it. a family heirloom I'm for your honoring play. I'm Maura. What do you know about honoring wearing anyone? Wearing it. Oh, well, it has excuse me. meaning to us. It has okay. meaning to me, too. It's a hard no. Oh, Kenny. <sighs> Mom. What? It's a complicated thing. There are feelings and dynamics. Well, I have feelings, too. Of course you do. Like, I'm feeling you're being a bit too dramatic. Mom, Stop. sometimes you have a way of dealing. Believe me, this is hard for me to say. Just say it, Sarah. Say it, Sarah. You have to promise not to overreact, oh. not to make faces, not to judge, you not to I interrupt. Just listen. I have boundaries. Why? I never knew I had them. They is me. I'm a true codependent. Making everybody happy first instead of me. Boundaries. Yes, I know this word, boundaries. It's a line someone draws in the sand that says don't cross over here to me. Can be gentle, little social reminders, like the way you tap a kitty cat on the nose. And boundaries can be dark lines that grow deeper with more time. Honey, frankly, I am not fine with how this story goes. <gasps> You're doing it again. You're not listening to me. Well, you're not listening to no, me! Okay, that's triggering. What is this triggering? It's when I'm trying to talk about my feelings and you make it about you and I get re-traumatized. How are you traumatized? By your complete invalidation of our boundaries! Oh, thank you. Of my boundaries! Oh, please. Fine. I'm never going to say anything ever again. I will never have an opinion oh, around yes. any of you ever again. Happy? Satisfied? Mom, oh. please. All I'm saying is that our parent just died, and we would like you to think before you speak and act respectfully. That's a lot to ask. It's my boundary. Um, it's so great. <laughs> so fun. Some, some good men alone in there, too. Yes, we have awesome. Eric Lieberman, who is uh, Joshie's doppelbanger, <laughs> who is in uh, War Paint, both of the good men and on, and on the yeah. Broadway. Um, and, uh, you know, original Chicago hometown or Amy Landecker. Did you know Amy from nope, Chicago? No, I met her out in L.A. Oh, okay. So I was like, they must have known each other in Chicago. No. Um, and Amy, who was in... Um, Blue Surge, which uh, Rebecca Gilman play, which was really, which I remember. And I do, I feel like that night I hung out with her the night I saw the show because I knew a bunch of people in the cast, maybe. And I think she, she said to say hi to you. She said to say hi. She texted me. Yeah. And it's, there's lots of great things come out of Chicago, I will say. Yeah. Um, yep. I, 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 you know, what I also, it's like in watching that clip again, it reminds me of, there's so much love. Like, it's like, like, seeping out of their pores, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, humans are like, stay away from me. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like radiating off the hand is like the laser beam of like love also. Mm -hmm. And how like complex that is. It's like why we stay, right? It's mm -hmm. like, I'm having this conversation with you because I love you. Even mm -hmm. if yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. It's, I, I love, I love watching that. I love just the, um, 
kind of the, the way that everybody's sort of got a double and that everybody's being doubly amplified, that the, the way it's choreographed. And when I look back and I think about choreographing that and shooting it, and I think we felt a little bit like, okay, we're either going to put this brand aside for a decade and come back to it, or we're going to, you know, create some sort of choreography on ice, Battle of the Network stars, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we're just, we're 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 gonna sing. We're gonna dance, and we really we shot it in such a short amount of time. I think we shot it in twenty days, the whole thing. So we were choreographing and shooting, and 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 coming up with things on the fly, and just kind of singing and dancing our way out of this transition. You know, from a TV show into the transition to a musical. So, did you know at that point that you wanted to make the? live theatrical version. Yeah, I mean, we always have, as I said, from the beginning, like there was a musical that Faith had written, you know, th there was the big, you know, Hamilton <laughs> moment for Faith that like, this is just like, I've always assumed like one of these days that's gonna happen and we're gonna get there. So, and yeah, so we're, we're, it, the, we're writing the play right now, totally, totally different than the TV show musical. Like I'm looking at this and realizing like maybe some completely different songs, maybe none of the same songs, maybe for people who have never even heard of the television show Transparent. Mm -hmm. But we're working with Eva Price and Tina Landau. So I don't oh, know, Christ. again, like, a little bit of, of, of gossip, but um, we're having such an amazing experience with them. Um, just really making the transition and really learning, you know, and really, really learning what it means to write a show of this scope. Um, it's been amazing. Yeah, it feels, I mean, I can only think there's so many different ways that the audience receives information. Like, like in the, in the theater, it's you can't control where the audience is looking like right like you can't control their lens or like what they fixate mm -hmm. on or like what's happening where yes. you so can other places and so it really you have to kind of embed that like even from the writing about like what's important and what's not how to really like at every moment it's about how are you pulling the focus to the right thing so that they're threading through the right mm -hmm. narrative Thank um, you. I mean, that's exactly that's exactly what I need to learn. Yeah, that's, that's what we're learning. We're really learning that. You know, all things I'm just figuring out as we go. Yeah. But that's so. And I don't know if you're at liberty to say, like, content wise, is it? I mean, there's so much ground to cover when I think about all of Transparent. Is it going back over that ground? Is it new ground? Is it taking place where we left off? Is it adjacent? I yeah, I think it's adjacent. I think it has to be its own thing. You know, it just ha it has to assume. Um, the you know dream Broadway audience, you know, right? Anna and Debbie from Denver buying tickets, not sure what they're going to see, you know. Um, what is what is what is that show about family? What is that show about queerness? About transness? About being accepted? About being loved? About fighting for you know the center? Um, so yeah, we're we're writing it as we go and finding it, and I think it's for sure inspired. Of, you know, it's the same family. It's always going to be the Fafferman. Yeah. Um, um, so, yeah. And then, of course, like Faith and I are just obsessed with, as you can tell, like Shelly's POV, the underserved, forgotten generation, the women who make up most of the audience, you know, on Broadway, you look around and all the women are, you know, Shelly. They're going to get their, their moment. Their, their show. So exactly. So, Shelly's going to be doing a bunch of that, too. Just, I think, you know, just angling to, to be represented as the primary ticket buyer. The Jewish matriarch who introduced their kids to Broadway. I mean, you know, it's it's fantastic. You know, and it's, I also love like, I you know, I don't, I think obviously there's been a ton of like Jewish writers and creators, um, obviously like throughout history, entertainment industry. And, you know, we, we see, um, I mean, there's still obviously like an othering of, of Jewishness. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, when I, I had said in my introduction about like feeling so seen, it was very much about the like, the messiness. Um, you know, I mean, I remember having like non-Jewish friends come over to my house for dinner and they're like, why is everybody always yelling? And I was like, nobody's yelling. Like, this is what we talk. They're like, that's how I say I love you. you know, right. That's weird. Just a little, our volume's just a little higher, you know? Yeah. Um, and to be able to kind of like see that done without trying to like make it um, 
like cute and they didn't have to be schmaltzy. And it was just kind of a, a, a messiness that um, I think we often see like in permission of uh, the Jewish patriarch that like they're divided figures who can like fuck around and maybe drink too much and be unkind or mm -hmm. not their kids. But like, we don't see, you know, anyone else in the Jewish story necessarily behave that way. We're obviously yeah. like, we're all from the same stock. So, um, I mean, how much, how much of, how much of that? So like the Pfeffermans are Jewish, but like how much of that was intentional? Cause there's so, I mean, and then we have um, the amazing Catherine Hahn and we haven't even talked about it at all. Right. Like, yeah. Let's just talk about Catherine, Catherine Hahn. I'll do that all day with I you. Mean, I mean, she's amazing. Yeah. Rabbi right. One of my all time favorite, favorite, favorite movies. I mean, yeah, it was, you know, th that's so, that's so kind. Thank you. I feel like there are a group of Jewish women who <laughs> I am their perfect filmmaker. I um, mean, you, know, you are. Yeah. Like <laughs> really. Our lives, you know, and I remember making Afternoon Delight and just feeling like all of the, all of the different ways it was going to be a movie. Like, okay, I was going to set it in San Francisco and Chicago and movie stars and, big budget and then at some point it was like okay we're just going to be making this independently and so joey you have to just ask your kids preschool if we can shoot there and you have to shoot in your friends houses and it became silver lake i mean it was again me going around putting like flyers in people's houses and being like can i shoot in your house um and in making it my neighborhood and in making it silver lake it it, find, it became so personal that i think i really found my voice as a as a creator and i there's so much curiosity at the center of that movie i think that's mm -hmm. what I, there, there's oh it's I mean, it's it's quiet and small in many ways too, but there is a, um, there's like always ask it, like it's questions that curiosity that drives that movie forward for me. Mm. I loved it so much, but, but, yeah. but back like the amazing rabbi and like that whole side and then the, this, the truth the, of Israel. I mean, yeah. And then also like six feet under is kind of part one of transparent because there was rabbi Ari there, remember? Yeah. Yes. So I like to tell people I'm responsible for like 96% of the sexy rabbis on television. And now there's, there's a lot of sexy rabbis in real life. Now. What was that? I said there's all these sexy rabbis in real life too. I feel like growing up, I only knew like old male rabbis and now right. there's like hip, young, cool, smart rabbis. I know, too. right? Exactly. It's like cool to be Jewish again. You know, at least as a child, it felt like not cool. And now yeah. it's like, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. My, I don't know if my kids would agree with that assessment. If yeah. I to interview them. You have to show them the uh, finale and, and see if they can write a, a song. I think before this, you and I were talking about tour portions and run from your father's house, which became the theme of the finale. And Ari's missed, you know, Bart Mitzvah and the story that happens, you know, every week and the same story being told in temples all over the world every week. You know, when you realize that that there's a collective storytelling. Um, that's exactly the same, no matter, you know, where you are, you can walk into any Shabbat service in any place on the planet and everybody would be on the same Torah portion. Yeah. I think when I realized that I just like got so excited about just the theater that's at the center of Jewish ritual. And I, and I, and, and the, the question, I love that. And it's, and we love ritual as humans, I think, and that's why like the theater exists and storytelling exists. And then when you're talking about something like Judaism, where these rituals were established centuries ago in the desert, mainly by men, and so many of them excluded women. So it's like, how do we, it's like, again, that wrestle of like, how do we preserve the idea of ritual, yet how are we sort of rewriting or recentering the narrative so that we can like sort of march forward honoring like it feels like honoring the essence of what the thing like means or wants to be yes yeah well just in terms of like a discovery that i've had over the course of the pandemic i was given this thing called an amulet by a friend of mine named amakai who's a um, rabbi <clears throat> and it was this thing that you could like stick on your door to keep the plague away back in the oldie days and he's like hey everybody here's like these amulets that keep the plague away and i um texted him and said what does it say and he said, let me get back to you. And a few weeks later, he got back to me. And it says a bunch of things, including if you want to keep the plague away, say my name. I am the mother of Abraham. I am Amtali. And say my mother's name. Her name is Carnabo. And so I started Googling, like, who's Amtali? Who's Carnabo? Wait, Ab who is Abraham's mother? You know, because we're, we talk about these Abrahamic religions and Abrahamic law. And I was like, wait. 
You know, his father was like Tarak and the idols and you could find a story that everybody learns about Judaism and about worshiping false idols where, you know, where Abraham is, you know, accusing his father of being an idol worshiper. Um, but it's like, but, but, but who's his mom, you know, like, yeah. was he hatched like L. Ron Hubbard? And how come I've never asked the question yeah. of who's his mom? Like I'm obsessed with Jewish women and I've never, and it's a matriarchal religion and I've never thought, wait, who's his mother? So to find out about Amtelai and her mother, Carnabo, um, you know, I think the ritual has to be created understanding that the Torah was written to distract from the mother. Because when Abraham, when God says to Abraham, you know, in the moment of crisis, I am your staff. I am your rod. When you're about to die, think of me and a rod. Right. Instead of like mama. Not your mom. Right. And also like to never go, like, oh yeah, and mama, when you're thinking about I am your mm -hmm. rod and your staff, but like also and mama, like no. So much no that I had never even thought about it before. And I'm sure you haven't either. Because whenever I tell people this, they kind of- We see it. it. So I'm, I'm thinking that's part of like my transformation is really trying to think of Judaism through the lens of being written to kind of erase um, a pagan woman who was the mother of everybody's father. Oh my God, I can't wait for Delaney, for my daughter, to watch the replay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. her mind blown as we're in yeah, yes. the have right her, have her, Just ask her the question of who's Abraham's mother, and then she'll Google and find nothing at all. Nothing at all. And then I'll ask her to go ask the rabbi. Yes. And the, and the, and people, rabbis say stuff like, not much is known about her. Yeah. And I go, Why not? And they're like, yeah. I don't know. You know, but the, well, nobody existed. Why didn't well, she, yeah, right. she must have existed, existed. She yeah. from somewhere? And also, how come Abraham never said her name or no, you know, and also like, you know, Isaac is Abraham's kid. Didn't Isaac ever say, do I have a grandmother? <laughs> you know, right. So you like these, and also like these women, Amtala and Carnaba, we're getting way off track here, but I, no, you know, I, I like to use this for, for good. But like these women, Amtala and Carnaba, they're the mother and the grandmother, not only of the Jewish people, but also the Muslim people. Yeah. Abraham's their son too. So. I wonder if it appears anywhere in um, Islamic writing. It does, yes. She's known as, as Umthala. It's U-M-T-H-A-L-A-A-H. Yes, yeah. nearly, but a different spelling, same erasure. But now, what I, now I'm like twisting it to the positive as I'll tend to do, which is that like these women were so powerful that a whole book had to be written to distract centuries of people. That's how magical and amazing they are. Yes, like, exactly. Yeah, it's so yeah. great. I love that. I love I love that it's, you're, it's hitting you like that because that's how it hits me. It's like, it's huge. Oh, it's so, oh gosh, my mind is really blown. And um, because it's making me speechless, we should offer uh, some space for people to ask oh, yeah. questions. questions. <laughs> that was a pretty good segue. Yeah. Um, Gosh, that's really amazing. Okay, so Laura Coover asks, do your actors improvise while shooting? If yes, yeah. how do you yes, say yes, that? Yes, 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 yes. I definitely, speaking of the annoyance, I take a lot of what I learned from McNapier and I, and I bring it to the set. And it's sort of this idea of would instead of should, could instead of, could instead of should, would instead of should, like anything can happen, process over product. Uh, from the moment really that we all come to the set, I really like to center the bodies of the artists because normally if you're on the set, they're centering the schedule, time, money, things with numbers in it or equipment or light. Um, and really I learned, you know, this is from sort of Joan Shekel, who's another uh, amazing guru of mine. This idea that what we're watching is, you know, we're watching actors do something to get what they want. So we're doing, when we're doing transparent or I love Dick, we're doing that playable action. What are you doing to get what you want? Um, and what you want is, you know, a, a playable action is a verb you can feel. And we want to be able to film the actors doing these feelings and watching light play over skin and water as they inhabit a verb. Right. So it comes we, from them. I love yeah, that. Yeah. From their bodies, the playable action photographing the playable and action. And then there's like a dance between the camera and the actor. Yes. That's like exactly. very Our cinematographer, his name is Jim Frona. He's also doing a playable action. Right. So really, yeah. sometimes we wouldn't even yell action because we would be finding ourselves getting in such a cool vibe of like, okay, this is your house. This is your set. This is your husband. Start living, loving, and laughing. And we'll kind of creep in with the camera. We always know where the beat changes are. So everybody is totally free to improvise. 
but the awareness of where the beat changes are. So in theater talk, when people change what they're doing to get what they want, that's always really clear. So yeah. normally yeah. the script supervisor is looking for continuity errors. We add on to that a kind of collective consensus about where the beat changes are. Right. So it's like you have the you have all the bones there, and it's like yeah. how, how you connect them. All. Get there. Yes. So like what outfit that skeleton is wearing can be yes. different. Or what, what actor? What playable action? You know. Yeah. That's for, a great for our audience, Laura. Get that. Thank you. We're totally yeah. ready for more. That's awesome. That's so exciting. We I work similarly but differently. But yeah, uh, Caroline Neff. Hi, Caroline. Um, how do you keep your work absurdly funny and deeply mortal and human? That line feels like a tricky one to walk, and yet it seems so effortless. Yeah, just you know, I really bring the kind of delight and absurdity to work. Thinking like, I can't believe. I get this privilege where we have cameras, where we have actors, where we're playing. And so when I'm casting, I just cast people who I find, you know, deeply funny, mortal human. You know, I, I cast people that I want to be near. And I think of myself as an, al an alchemist of just what it feels like to be in that space so that they can really be free to take risks. So I'm never really going for any of those qualities. I'm just trying to surround, you know, our workspace with people who, have you know have that that sort of it's like a triumvirate of like funny dirty sad is sort of the uh <laughs> the tone. that could be my autobiography <laughs> <laughs> funny dirty sad um but i but i think what's also something that i want to give you credit for is that you're you must be creating spaces where that like vulnerability and like safety. And um, I liked what you said in the answer to the last question about like that, that those sort of like artists and their bodies, like they are at the center of it, that that is what is most important. And that is, um, you know, I, I don't know that everybody listening to this knows that that's, that's so rare and such a special thing about that, that the alchemist is creating spaces where from whoever is operating the camera to, you know, there's so many people involved in so many teams and to create a body where all the organs are working in harmony into their fullest potential so that they're able to do that stuff is, uh, is no, no easy task and something oh, thank that's you. Really that. also inherent in all of your work. So thank you. yeah, now let's get on. Next question. Delia for Kimberly, tell us about how support group for men advanced your growth around gender identity relative to serving patriarchal stories. Oh my gosh. First of all, hi, Delia. We have to continue this conversation um, ongoing. Um, Support Group for Men was a play that I started developing out at Ojai and then at Ojai Playwrights Conference. And then we did a developmental workshop at the Goodman and then did it on the main stage of the Goodman, written by mm -hmm. the fantastic Ellen Ferry. And um, that play, as it's titled, Support Group for Men, is, has a you know, group of guys who are like just trying to figure out their way in the world because the world's like not taking care of them as well as it used to. Mm. So it's a very comic, um, you know, one of the characters cleans the bean in Millennium Park and like one day can no longer see his reflection and feels mm. all those sensors aren't responding to them. And it's the kind of sense of this growing invisibility of, um, you know, it's it's it was written and directed by a woman who I think we were able to put our own sense of invisibility and project mm -hmm. that onto a, a group of men. Wow. So in their in their time together, where they're eating wasabi peas and drinking rosé and trying to understand how apps work, um, there is uh, some violence that happens. It takes place in Chicago. It's violence that happens in the alley, and this this character comes in who um, is an, a non-binary being. Um, and, you know, through the evolution of that play and through so many conversations of which Dealey, who asked the question, was a part of, and the Goodman Theater was really supportive of having these questions about representation and who's on our stages and what are we teaching through our work and what are we responsible for. Um, I think, you know, that, that, que that question of, of what it did for me personally was I learned a lot and I listened a lot and and continue to attempt to understand stories that are not my own. But we, so much of that character was based on the actor who played that character. And he was really able to talk about his experience, about how it felt when he first started wearing wigs and what that was like for him and what it feels like to be, he's interested in the intersection and being, he's like um, in sort of, 
in sort of hyper masculinity and hyper femininity and how those mm. things intersect. Like he works out a lot and like he actually runs a personal training program and has this like amazing like pumped physique and he loves like seeing a camisole like on that physique. It's a very like, mm. and that feels powerful. Um, and so really trying to like lean into that individual story and knowing that I can't represent all stories and I can't, and that there is no monolithic experience um, for people and hoping to, to, to be able to tell an individual story that will maybe strike chords in other people. I hope mm -hmm. that is your question, Delia, because I do feel that it merits a longer thing, but we, uh, you know, short, short on time and want to get to another question, but I, I, uh, hope that we can have a further conversation in the future. Let's get one more question. Emma asks, very exciting to hear about the prospect of a Broadway musical. Can you share any details about what will differ from the TV finale musical versus the Broadway musical? Yeah, as I said, we're kind of, you know, Faith and I feel so lucky to be collaborating, you know, with Tina Landa, who's a hero of ours, with Eva Price, who, I mean, it's just like an all Jewish lesbian crew. You know? <laughs> you just kind of um, feel incredibly lucky to learn. And we're in learning mode right now about playwriting, about musical writing, about, about the development process, about the songwriting process. We're having so much fun. And as I said, I think we want it to exist in a world where you don't have to have seen Transparent to walk in and have a completely satisfying experience. It's in its own universe, same character names. But um, for for the people who know the show, then they would, you know, find a million familiar things. But for the people who've never seen it, they would hopefully walk into something that that felt brand new. Um, I love that. I'm like dying to see it. You should ask. Mm -hmm. You should ask Tina about. I've been. Uh, <laughs> she said, she, another person who told me to say hi to you. Yes. So I was the first, the first time Tina ever met, I was like fangirling and begging her to be her assistant on this musical she directed, and like like begging her and like had had all, done all this research and all this stuff and like make this huge presentation to her, and she was like, I just. She's like, I can't, I can't ask you to get me a sandwich. And I was like, no, but I'll, but I'll get you a sandwich. I don't have to say anything. I don't have to be smart. I don't have to have information. I don't need to know anything. I just, you know, it's like in that moment. Now I'm, I'm a little bit like, I wonder, maybe I'll pitch myself again if she's needing an yeah. assistant because. If she didn't hire you because you, kind of, you were too eager. I, I don't, I was either like too, I, I'm not sure. I feel like now she might tell me the truth. I wonder if I was too annoying. You know, like, <laughs> well, having like a big presentation to be somebody's assistant. Right. Yeah, there was like a, there was an overachieving quality, which um, and a, a tenacity and a um, you know, like, and if we were like like in real life, like I'm gonna like dive across the table into your lap type of person, and 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 I think she might have been a little bit like, okay, yeah, <laughs> you off my lap under the table, yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, I was like 23. I didn't know a lot about boundaries. Um, and I look, I actually look back. There, there's a, there's an actress in Chicago. Her name is Donna Blue Lackman. I don't know if you remember her or know who she is. Oh, you. She reminded me that when I was like around that age, I sent her a letter after having seen her show. And it was so filled with this kind of, I'm enthusiastic about you. Don't you want to know? Yeah. You know, I had no you. sense of like, no, I hadn't been beaten down yet. No. I just wanted her to know how much she transformed me. And it's a really embarrassing letter. Yeah. But you know, when you're young and, you, and the world has a big equivalent, you just, you think your enthusiasm is, is interesting to people. Right. Yeah, or like a gift somehow. Like it, there was sort of a like. It's a gift. Exactly. Exactly. You think it's a gift. Want me around you. Right. Amplifying you and lifting you up all the time. Exactly. Um, <laughs> well, we unfortunately like have to end this conversation or, or, or give people the opportunity to still light their seventh night of Hanukkah candles. Right. And um, do that. Keep burning the oil. We do have one special treat for, as, as we say goodbye though, right? One more clip we for the do, we do. I, want, I want us to remind everybody that they, um, that they, I have a couple of things I want to remind. I want to thank everybody for being here this evening and tuning in. And a reminder, or if you weren't here in the beginning, that you can, um, the Christmas Carol that we have is audio version of Christmas Carol, which is available through our website and um, through public radio on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, which is so special and great. Mm -hmm. And other free programming we have, which is the incredibly stimulating uh, Until the Flood, which is written and performed by Dale Orlander Smith who is one of our artistic associates. And that is also available through our website. 
um, through a, a partnership with All Arts. So those things are available. And um, Joey, thank you so much. Uh, this is really a- I really appreciate being invited. Pandemic highlight for me. Maybe. I feel like we're in Chicago right now. I know. Well, well, and next year, as we say, in Chicago. <laughs> next year in Chicago. Next year in Chicago. Um, and so, and everybody at home, um, be well and stay safe and mask up. Uh, and I look forward to seeing everybody in the theater, hopefully sooner rather than later. So, Joe, you want to tell us about our treat? Well, you know, can't get enough of seeing that real life Brady Bunch. We've been looking for this show, and I just like it doesn't matter. I just want to watch all of it. So here's just here's one more to take you out. Yay. <laughs>